When was the last time that you were keenly aware that you were having to trust someone? The last time where like it wasn't, trust wasn't just implicit. Sometimes that's how life works, where we just implicitly trust someone. But when was the last time you were keenly aware that you were having to trust someone? You're sending your spouse out to, to get something from the grocery store? I, this one's personal for me. I, I'm usually, you know, when my wife sends me out to get something from the grocery store, I remember it when she tells me. But when I get there, I forget. And I do remember that I like ice cream. So I come back with ice cream, having forgotten what I was supposed to get. And also, I let, apparently forgetting that I could have called her. And so Candace, is, my wife, is very aware that she's trusting me when she sends me out. I'm trusting you. Maybe it was sending your child to anchor students for the first time recently. Maybe your kid was moving up to sixth grade and you're like, okay, you're going to be good. Or anchor kids on a Sunday morning as you check them in and walk down the hallway. I'm trusting you, anchor. Maybe it's taking someone's recommendation to try a new coffee shop when you look online and you see it only has three stars. All right, I'm, I'm trusting you. We cannot live without trust. You can't. You can't live without trust. Trust is what allows a family to be a family. Trust is what allows a school to exist with the administrator's trust the teachers, and the teachers trust the administrators, and the parents trust the teachers and the administrators, and kind of hopefully trust also the students, their students, their kids. Governments, one of the biggest challenges in our moment in politics is that there is so much distrust, so it keeps us from being able to have like a peaceful relationship with those in elected office. And some of us are nervous right now when it comes to November because of our lack of trust. Business deals. We ensure that we need more than a handshake because we want pen and ink. We want paper. We want something we can look to because trust is great until it's not, right? Trust. And so it is with our or humanity's trust in God, and you could also say God's trust in humanity. This in Genesis chapter 3, trust the cord of trust between God and Adam and Eve is what the enemy goes after. Just as a refresher, God created the world good. He says it seven times. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's almost like an artist fawning over something that he's made. He can't get over the fact of how good this world is. And it's important to know that goodness still exists today. You see it as the sun shines and opens on a new morning and there's beauty all around us. We talked about this and couple weeks ago. And at the end of this, he says, very good, looking over everything he made, especially even us humans, very good. And last week, Venice so powerfully talked about we, us humans, and how we bear the image of God. And how we're placed in creation to image who God is in God's creation and to reflect him throughout creation. This affects how we treat each other and how we understand who we are in this world. And then, today, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The seventh day in creation, when God made humans, God makes it, and then he, he says, like, be fruitful and multiply. He says, it's almost like he's like, I'm turning you loose, you know? 
It, you get this picture, you know, he's like, go bring order to this beautiful, wild world that I have made bring order to this place. It's kind of almost like this image of like a parent dropping off their kid at college, you know? You're like, go, except without the anxiety and without all the debt. Although we'll see how in Genesis 3, how there is debt and anxiety comes in there. But, but imagine at this point in Genesis 2, it's just trust. God says, go. Have fun. Enjoy. Make more of yourself. This is a beautiful invitation. We see it here in Genesis 2.15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. Now, this is interesting because work happens before things go bad, which means that work is actually, it participates in the goodness of creation, which means that if you don't like your job, it's, I guess, maybe your job's fault or your fault, but it's not God's fault. Work participates in the goodness of creation. It's part of how we're made. It's, we have purpose when we do something with our hands and with our mind, when we bring some type of order out of some type of disorder. God calls humanity to that. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat and from any tree in the garden. What a great command. Have fun. Eat lots of food. You could command me to do that. <laughs> but then we zoom in on one particular tree. Verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So there's this one tree that seems to have the knowledge of good and evil woven into it. And God says, not that one. Everything else, anything else, bushes, my little berries on the bushes, go for it. The big trees with the big fruit, go for it. Any, all the things, anywhere except for this one. And you might ask, well, what's so wrong with humanity having the knowledge of good and evil? What could be wrong with that? Well, think about this. Remember in Genesis 1, how God is the one that declares what is good? This is good. 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 Very good. So with humanity, if they eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, what that means is, is that their understanding, they take, they, they move away from letting God, the creator, be, being the one to define what is good. And they, creation, begins to think that I can make the decision of what is good by myself, apart from creator. And thus begins the process of disorder and distortion and confusion. So God says, that is not for you. Let me be the one that defines what is good. You can trust me. It is not God being overly prohibitive or restrictive. It's God saying, I am creator. I am the one that is best. I can tell you. I'll show you what is good. You don't need to create and think of it by yourself. And so it's, it's, it's right here, this little this cord of trust between God and humanity that the snake attacks. Now, Hebrew and Christian thinkers, when they've seen the snake in the garden, uh, they've, they've throughout history, they've understood it to be Satan, the accuser, um, as kind of symbolically represented in some way with the snake. Now, it doesn't exactly say that, but it's, a, it's, it's totally appropriate to assume that, to see that in the text. So what we see when he shows up, we see that begins, he begins just introducing some doubt. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any 
other of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The idea of being like, oh my gosh, do you like really? Like he's so restrictive. I can't believe that, that he would, did he really even say that? He couldn't have said that. That seems like a total jerk creator. You don't, I mean, do you really even want to listen to what he says? Introducing a little doubt. Beginning to attack with some jabs. That sacred cord of trust between the creator and his image bearers. You're so, he's so restrictive. He doesn't get what you need. I have, you, you should just, you should just do it. And it moves from the introduction of doubt to the distortion of truth. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the tree in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. All of a sudden, Eve, somehow there's some misunderstanding. There's some distortion. Who, whoever, no one said you can't touch it. You can touch it. You can look at it. I'm sorry. I think of the documentary Spinal Tap. Anybody? <laughs> it's classic in American cinema. Don't even look at it. It's a reference for those of you that have watched it. Eve has added to what God instructed her. He's, she's developed, she's, she's distorted what God. She must understand the heart and the prohibition. She's, she doesn't get it. So the introduction of doubt collides with the distortion of truth and then the haymaker, the knockout blow from the snake to the trust that is keeping the image bearers and the creator connected, an appeal to desire. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, doing good from evil. There's this slow progression through which trust gets black eyes until it's beaten. And this is exactly what the serpent's goal is, the snake's goal is. It's not to try to convince Adam and Eve to, to do the wrong thing. That'd be too small. It's much more grandiose. The heart, the desire... The conniving, weaving thought from the snake is to destroy trust. And nothing less. Why is God being so withholding? Doesn't it look beautiful? What a jerk. He's so prohibitive. Every, really, emerging adolescent has to deal with something parallel to this. Every teenager, as they develop moving from the primary identity being mom and dad, the parent, to the peer. And all of a sudden in the peer group, and it doesn't matter what school you end up choosing, it always ends up happening, the adolescent or the teenager has to make the decision who will I trust? Except it's a lot more complicated on this side of Eden. It's a lot more difficult. It'd be interesting to imagine that first time there, you know. When there's this first tension. We see in verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. You see, what the snake has done is he's, he's, he's kind of like as this demented, evil, like, tour guide. He said, look, take note of this. Look at this. And all of a sudden, the, the woman's attention has 
fixated on the thing that she can't have. You want to know something about yourself. Where are you setting your attention? Like what, what are you giving your attention to? You know, the direction you go is determined by the attention you give to a particular thing. And so her attention is cast on that particular thing and she's missing out and not seeing every other thing that is full on available, God giving them permission to enjoy. Everything else is missed and she's fixated on that one thing. Maybe it feels familiar that we're fixated on the one thing she sees it's good and pleasing and desirable. So she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You know, it's interesting, you know, at the end of chapter 2 in Genesis, and you can look this up, it, it says... And they were naked and unashamed. Um, what a weird, you know, I'm like, and then all of a sudden, here's, they're naked and they're full of shame. You know, the experience of being naked, the experience of kind of like being aware that you're naked, it's a uniquely human thing. I don't know if you knew that. I have never in my life <laughs> been in the line at Fred Meyer and looked for my wallet. Oh. Oh my gosh, I'm completely naked. That is a bad dream. It's a uniquely human thing. The connection of shame and nakedness. I mean, no other thing in creation, no bird of the sky, no fish of the sea, no animal of the land has this anxiety about being naked. They're perfectly content. There are some dogs that wear sweaters. That also is a human problem, though. <laughs> so they sew fig leaves together. What a terrible solution. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Some of the brightest minds in psychology have studied the effect of shame How, do you, how can you tell when someone's experiencing shame? And the conclusion by some of these brightest minds is no different from what we see here in Genesis chapter 3. Avoidance and withdrawal. You duck the call. You avoid the person when you see him in the grocery store. You cast the eyes down so you don't have to look somebody in the eyes. You quiet quit. You don't reply. Shame often shows up in avoidance and withdrawal. And this is what they're, they're trying to do. Adam and Eve are hiding. They hide from each other because they're feeling shame about their nakedness. And here it's important to note, this is not just physical nakedness. It's this expansive idea of nakedness. It's emotional, psychological, spiritual nakedness that we're being talked about. It is the fear of being known. And humanity, ever since this moment in time, has wrestled with this tension of wanting to be known, but being afraid of being known. This is, this is the, the best of psychology we have written thousands of years ago. It's almost as if it's inspired. Avoidance and withdrawal. And their best solution is fig leaves. Have you ever thought you were dealing with the problem, but you ended up highlighting the problem by your attempt at dealing with the problem? You know, what, what, a, what a way to highlight that problem. I'm uniquely triggered by this uh, because every time I try to do anything, of, of any, of anything with my car or with my garden or with my home, 
I always end up trying to solve the problem, but end up creating another problem, highlighting the problem. <laughs> Triggered. It's like fig leaves. Their desire, their attempt to solve the problem highlights it. Feel more shame trying to cover over the thing that they're afraid of being seen and known. They're trying to protect themselves. They hide from God. And you know, like, what's God's response to this? This is like his image bearers that he said very good over. And he said, go have lots of kids and like eat all the best food. I mean, what a great invitation. Like, what's he going to do now? That it's all seemingly mucked up is it like all right holy spirit you get the kerosene christ you get the match we got to start afresh no he says these three words the three words that are probably some of the most important words ever spoken they reverberate throughout scripture and up to this present moment where we are right here. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The words, where are you, mouthed by the creator God, are words that highlight distance. You are not with me. Something wrong has happened. You are not trusted. So, where you have moved away from me. You have moved away from trust. Where are you? That highlights distance. While also highlighting approach. I desire you enough to come near. Both of these things are communicated with the words that God says. He acknowledges the distance and shows the approach. These words show up in God's pursuit of humanity through covenants and prophets and Christ, as he says, I'd go for the one. I, the 99 could be here, but if there's one there, I'm running after the one. I came to seek and save those that are lost. Where are you? Maybe God is saying something like that to those of us right now. But he doesn't stop at that. There's another word. Who told you that you were naked? Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Who is setting the terms for your understanding of yourself? Who did you give the keys to? Who did you let start defining you when I'm the one who made you? Who was it? Who did it? These are questions you can ask yourself. I mean, mornings when you're spending some time in the Word or on a walk, on a drive, and you turn the radio off, just ask the questions, am I hiding? Who is defining me? Am I hiding right now? Is there anything that, that, that should be known that I'm Covering over with fig leaves. And who, who, who's letting, who am I letting define me? Trusting in God looks like living in vulnerability before God and letting him define you. Trusting in God looks like living in vulnerability before, before him. Not concealing anything. He knows it all. It's silly to try to hide. And letting his word be the defining word over your life. Any other definition will end up at some point condemning you. 
because it's based on something you can do or not do. God's word over you holds you, protects you, deepens your sense of who you are, create, makes it less fragile. Bible scholars call this the fall because no one since has known the ease of Eden. We are east of Eden, you and I. Hiding is normal. Shame is too common. Shalom feels fleeting. When you look through the rest of Genesis 3, you'll see that more of the effects of the fall start to show up. Marriages become complicated. Work becomes frustrating. Childbearing, painful. Cain and Abel, brothers, they kill each other. It gets worse and spirals out of control because trust was attacked. And all the repercussions start spilling out the fall. But there's good news. The where are you of God keeps on moving forward even as humanity keeps fleeing the God who pursues out of love. To the point in the New Testament where we discover the ultimate good news. You see, when Adam, while Adam fell into temptation in paradise, Jesus showed himself to be the true Adam by not succumbing to Satan's temptation in the barrenness of the desert. And while Adam experienced the vulnerability of nakedness because of sin, Christ was stripped bare so that he might bear our sins. And while Adam experienced death as a consequence, Christ experienced death as an act of sacrificial love so that all of us who are in Adam might be in Christ and experience eternal life. As Paul said it, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How do you understand yourself? Because God understands you to be the righteousness, his own righteousness. That's how he understands you to be if you're in Christ. There is no shame. There is no condemnation. There is a declaration of your deep worth. Here's the beautiful thing. When that word settles down past your head and into your heart, you can be courageous about being known. You know you don't have to hide because even the things that would have caused shame in the past don't stand against you anymore. You're free. So if any of us are hiding, hear Christ saying, where are you? I have nothing but love for you. If any of us are letting the snake define us, hear Christ saying, you belong to me. Am I hiding? Who am I letting define me? There's freedom in Christ. And his identity his word over us speaks a better word than anything else. Every week we do communion here, and admittedly it can get to the point where you treat it a little like a mindless activity. Part of that, we, we, we want to guard against that by allowing you time to kind of just sit and reflect each week. We do think it's formative to do it each week. But this week I want to just... Just really call all of us to when we approach the communion table to hear the words Christ's body given for you, Christ's blood shed for you as a 
soul identity-forming thing over who we are. Sit in it. Savor it. There's prayer stations at both sides of the room. And those prayer stations are available for you to come and you don't even have to say what you need prayer for. You can just say, I'd like prayer. And they'll pray for you. They'll join you as you say, I'm, I'm here and I have a need. So as we sing, as we take communion, as we get prayer, don't miss out on the invitation to come out of hiding and to let the one who is love define who you are. We'll pray here before we step into worship and communion. So if you would, close your eyes and just maybe take a second or two to let his word kind of uh, start to settle over us. His identity-defining word. Holy Spirit, would you come in this place? Where you are, there is no space for shame. It has no place here. It has no power here. There is freedom where you are. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. I recognize for some of us, we're at the beginning of a journey of following you, and this is all new content. And we pray that in the way that only you can, would you meet us? For some of us, we've traveled with you for a long time, but maybe there's something that we're still hiding. Help us to know that we're safe, to be vulnerable with you. And for some of us, we're in the middle of a deeply challenging moment. Yeah. And I just pray that we would sense your kindness, your warmth. As you find us, as we raise our hand in the middle, in the middle of wherever we are, and may we only have the ears to hear your word over us, which says, beloved, my kiddo, deeply and dearly loved. We pray these things would just dwell in power, spirit, in this room and in our lives. And it's in your name, the name of Jesus Christ, the unrivaled one that we pray. Amen.